Chapter Thirteen of The Sword of Deborah by F. Tennyson Jesse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Thirteen, General Servants and a General Question. I have left till the last what to some people will be the dullest and what is certainly the least spectacular of all the work done by the women in France, but what is to me perhaps the most wonderful and admirable of all. I mean that of the domestic staffs for there is something thrilling about driving wounded, something eternally picturesque about nursing them, but there is no glamour about being a general servant. A general servant, year in, year out, with no wages at that, for I talk of the voluntary staffs, girls of gentle birth and breeding, who deliberately undertake to wash dishes and clean floors and empty slops day after day. I think heroism can no higher go, and I am not trying to be funny. I mean it. All the voluntary camps I had seen, all the hostels, the rest stations, and many hospitals, are staffed by voluntary domestic help, and the girls they wait upon, the drivers and secretaries and such like, are eager in recognition of them. But that seems to me about all the recognition they do get. They get no snappy pars, no photographs in the picture papers, no songs are sung of them, no reward is theirs in the shape of medal or ribbon nothing but the sense of a dish properly cleaned or rugs duly swept under. I consider that there ought to be a special medal for girls who have slaved as general servants during the war, without a thrill of romance to support them. A skivvy's ribbon, as one of them laughingly suggested to me when I propounded the idea. Take, for example, the headquarters of the British Red Cross, at the Hotel Crystal at Boulogne, to which I returned on my homeward way, as I had come to it on landing. The staff, counting the commissioner and officials, the clerks, typists, secretaries, and post-office girls, amount to about a 145 people, and the house staff numbers 70 and are all VADs. The Hotel Crystal is also the headquarters for all Red Cross people going on leave or arriving there from Boulogne, and all have to report there. Nearly all want a meal, many want a bed. These men workers, and many of the women, such as VAD commandants, etc., live out in billets in the town, but the manageress and her assistant, the post-office commandant, the girl driver of the mail-car with her orderly, these two girls drive about sixty miles daily with the mails, the girls of the telephone exchange, and the rest of the post-office girls all live in, and in addition to the casual Red Cross workers who may appeal for a bed, any time, there are the relations of wounded who have been put up there whenever possible, though now a hostel is being opened in Boulogne for the purpose." All the people working in the house and all Red Cross workers arriving by boat are entitled to take their meals at the Crystal, as are all Red Cross workers in Boulogne, both officers and privates, and the average number of meals served is twenty-five hundred a week. Four or five girls act as waitresses in the dining-room, and three are always in the pantry, which must never be left for a moment during the day. So it will be seen that the headquarters of the Red Cross is a sort of hotel, except that nobody pays. There are French servants to do the roughest work, but the girls have plenty to do without that. The house staff begin work at seven in the morning. At seven-thirty in the evening they start to turn out, the forty-two offices, which they sweep and dust every day. They wash all the tea things, not the dinner things, and clean all the silver and glass. They make the beds and do the waiting. A pretty good list of occupations, is it not, carried out on such a huge scale? The girls are well looked after, for it must not be forgotten that some of them are not more than eighteen, and their parents in England have a right to demand that these children should be at once guarded and cheered. No Red Cross girl is allowed out after half-past nine in a restaurant, and none is ever allowed to dine out unaccompanied by another girl. But when a friend of a girl passes through Boulogne, then it is permitted that she and the other girl may go and dine with the officer in question, always provided that they are back by nine-thirty. For superiors are merciful and human creatures these days, and there is always the thought that the girl may never see that friend again, and heaven, and the superior, knows that these girls need and deserve a little relaxation and enjoyment. And would you not think that to girls who work as these do, and behave so well, would at least be given the understanding and respect of all of us who do so much less? Yet how often one hears careless remarks of censure, or, worse, of belittlement. That to other nations our ways may need explaining is understandable, but we should indeed be ashamed that any amongst ourselves fail in comprehension." What do the French think of our women? That is a question that inevitably arises in the mind of anyone who knows the differences in French and English education. 
let me show the thing as I think it is, by means of a metaphor. It is universally conceded that marriage is a more difficult proposition than friendship, that it is more a test of affection to live under one roof and share the daily commonplaces of life than it is to meet occasionally when one can make a feast of the meeting. Yet this is not to say that marriage is the less admirable state, but only to allow that it is the one requiring greater sacrifices, greater tact, and greater affection. Therefore, when it is admitted that the presence in France for nearly four years of English soldiers, English civilians on war work, and the consequent erection of whole temporary townships for their accommodation, is a greater test, if you will a greater strain, for the entente, than if intercourse had been limited to an occasional interchange of a handful of people, one is not saying anything derogatory either to French hosts or to English guests, but merely frankly conceding that more depth of affection and understanding is necessary than would otherwise have been the case. To superficial relationships, superficial knowledge, but to the big partnerships of life, complete understanding. And, if that is never quite possible in this world, at least let the corner where knowledge cannot come be filled by tolerance. England is no longer on terms of mere friendly intercourse with France. The bond is deeper, more indissoluble. And as in marriage, the closest bond of all is the birth of children. So in this pact of nations, the greatest bond is the loss of children, lost for the same cause upon the same soil. With a bond as deep as this, a bond always acknowledged and given its meed of recognition by the most thoughtful brains and sensitive hearts, yet, as in marriage, there are bound to be minor irritations, points, not of meeting, but of conflict. Trifles, indeed, these points, compared with the magnitude of the bond which unites, but nevertheless trifles which would be better adjusted than ignored. In the first place, we must recognize that though the things which unite us, our common ideals, our common needs, are far stronger than any difference in our modes of thought, yet those differences exist, and that, in marriage, it is often said that it is the little things which count. Heaven forbid that we should so lose sense of proportion as to say it when the matter in hand is the marriage of nations, but nevertheless it is well not entirely to forget it. And, of all the differences in customs between us, there is probably none more marked than our way of treating what is known, loosely and with considerable banality, as the sex problem. This is not the place to discuss those differences, though, as one who has known and loved France all her life, I may mention that, personally, I see much to admire in the French system, and could wish that we emulated it, but that is neither here nor there at the moment. France has probably evolved for the happiness and welfare of her womenkind, the sort of life which suits best with their temperament and circumstances. Women, like water, find their own level, and no one who knows France, and knows the devotion, the business capacity, and the good works of her women, imagines them to be the butterfly creatures that English fancy used to paint them twenty or thirty years ago. As a matter of fact, the present writer had occasion, two winters ago, to make a close study of the varied scope of women's work in France, the hospitals for training of femmes du monde, the schools like Le Foyer, for the training of young girls of the upper classes to help their poor sisters, etc., etc. All works carried on unostentatiously long before the war broke upon us and proved their usefulness. The butterfly French women underwent, before the war, a far more serious social training than did the happy-go-lucky English girl, and was better equipped in consequence, with a knowledge of economic conditions, than the untrained English woman could be. But we too have our quality, and I rather think it to be found in the greater freedom which we are allowed. We were not so well trained, but freedom stepped into the place of custom, and gave the necessary attitude of mind, that unprejudiced, untrammeled attitude which is essential to the quick grasping of a fresh metre. That is where our method, or, if you prefer it, our lack of method, helped us, even as their training helped the French. And the French, with their extraordinary faculty of vision, do, I think, understand that we have simply pushed our freedom to its logical and legitimate outcome, that we could not be expected, after being accustomed, for many years past, to be on terms of simple easy friendship with men as with our own sex, above all, after working side by side with them since this war began, we could not be expected to say that we could not work with them in France, though we could in England, or that perhaps this girl would and that girl couldn't. We naturally proceeded to act en masse as we had acted individually, to do on a large scale what had been done on a small, to manipulate great bodies of women where before a few friends had worked together. 
in every large body of persons there are bound to be one or two individuals who fail to come up to the required standard but that does not alter the principle that what can be safely done in small quantities can be safely done in large provided the conditions are altered to scale and that is what we are doing and what our government is helping us to do that is what our women's army and our voluntary workers in france are the expression on a large scale of what bands of women here have been doing so successfully on a small scale since the beginning of the war helping and even replacing the men and just as with our peculiar training and mode of thought it is possible for the average englishwoman to eliminate sex as a factor in the scheme of things so it is possible to eliminate it in greater masses in other words it is perfectly possible to men and girls brought up with the english method of free friendly intercourse to work side by side to meet to walk together and to remain merely friends whether that is a good thing or not is another point altogether as it is whether it makes for charm in a woman certainly no woman in this world competes with a french woman for charm it is as recognized as an englishwoman's complexion and considerably more lasting probably it is not only ourselves and the americans among the races of the world who could have instituted such an experiment as that of our women's army but there is among the nations one which is supreme in flair in sympathy and a certain ability to comprehend intellectually what it might not understand emotionally and that nation is france i am confident that it will never have to be said that when english women sacrificed so much and to a french woman one does not need to point out what a sacrifice it is when a woman risks youth and looks in hard unceasing work that french women fail to understand them or to attribute motives to them other than those that have animated themselves in their own labors throughout the war that it must sometimes look odd to them one knows so well how can it be otherwise they see the girls khaki clad out walking without tommies hear the sound of music and dancing coming from the recreation huts where the girls are allowed to invite men and vice versa yet if you investigate you will find out that they are of an extraordinary simplicity these girls and men in their intercourse in their earnest dancing taught them by instructors from our young men's christian association inspired by nothing more heady than lemonade and chaperoned by the women officers who have attained a mixture of authority and motherly supervision over every individual girl that reminds me of nothing so much as the care born of a sort of divine cunning of a very dear and clever mother superior at a convent i once stayed at in france for the interesting point for both the french and ourselves to note is that in the treatment of our women's army in france we have taken a leaf out of their book we look after the girls with something of that love and care which surrounds a girl in france for many of the women's army are working girls who have never been guarded in their lives whose parents had probably after the lower class english way had very little influence with them and who though good honest rough girls were free to roam the streets of their native towns with their friends every evening once their work was over now for what is for many of them the first time in their lives they are being watched and guarded in a manner that is more french than english and which i find admirable as for their walks their friendships with men the personal observation of the acute french will show them that it is merely our anglo-saxon way and the official statistics will prove to any doubters how well both the girls and the men can be trusted to behave themselves we are a cold nation if you like but there it is it has its excellencies if not its charms so much for fundamental differences which when intelligence and sympathy go out to meet them become merely points on which temperaments agree to differ amicably each giving its meed of admiration to the other and for minor matters little things of different customs only that nevertheless occasionally in the strain of this war ruffle even friends i would say something like this which is in the hearts of us all france dear lovely france to so many of us adored for many years who has stood to us for the romance of the world we know that in many things our ways are not your ways and never will be nor would we wish it otherwise to each nation her distinctiveness or she loses her soul but when those ways of ours seem to you most alien say to yourself this is only england's differing way of doing what we are doing of fighting for what we are fighting for the saving of the right to individualism the right to be different to gain that we are all having to become alike just as to win freedom we are having for a time to give it up and the great thing to remember is that this terrible coherent community life 
is being born with only that eventually we may all be free men once more let us for all time differ in our own ways rather than agree in the german but also let us while differing understand chapter fourteen notes and queries on my last evening i sat and thought about the girls i had seen and known in greater and less degrees in passing and i saw them not as unthinking sporting young things who were having a great adventure but as girls who were steadily sticking to their jobs often without enjoyment save that of knowledge of good work well done and i thought of those prophets who gloomily foretell that women will never want to drop into the background again forgetful of the fact that where a woman is is never a background to herself i smiled as i thought of the eagerness with which these hard workers in mud and snow and heat will start buying pretty clothes again and going out to parties and i was very thankful to know how unchangedly women they had all remained in spite of the fact that they had had the strength to lay the privileges and the fun of being a woman aside for a time i remembered what the d of t had said to me when we discussed the question of how the girls would settle down when it was all over and how he had thought that even if they did not marry all would be well because they would have had their adventure i remembered too how that had seemed to me the correct answer at the time then later when that awful web of depression caught me and the horror of the schoolgirl conditions of life and all the apparent brightness had choked me i had all the more thought it true but marvelled still later when i caught glimpses of that wonderful spirit and that deep sophistication which had so cheered me i reversed the whole judgment and thought there was nothing in it now thinking it all over it seemed to me that somewhere midway lay truth these girls have had in a certain sense their adventure but when it is all over they will have a reaction from it and i believe that reaction will be pleasant to them that it will be the reaction and not the memory of adventure which will content them it is certain to any one who has worked as these girls work a considerable period of doing nothing in particular will be very acceptable they will all have to become themselves again which will be interesting dear wonderful girls you who wash dishes and scrub and sweep you girls of the women's army who replace men and who do it so thoroughly you drivers who are out in all weathers day and night sometimes for a week or more on end who face hardships such as were faced in those three weeks at tea when there were no fires and no water how glad i am to have met you so i sat and thought and then i picked up a copy of the times which had just come over and in the personal column this caught my eye lady wants war work preferably motor driving from three to five p m and i saw that it was not only those far removed from the war who misunderstood both what it demands and that which has arisen to meet those demands do we not nearly all fail to realize the magnitude and import of what is being done by these unspectacular workers behind the lines who are yet part of war itself and daily and nightly strengthen the hands of the fighters some of us in england realize as little as you in far-off countries and yet it should be our business to know because the least we can do is to understand so that we in our much less fine way can help them a little one tithe of the amount they help our fighting men not because of any desire of theirs for praise is it necessary i never saw a healthier disregard amounting to a kindly contempt for what those at home think or don't think than among the women working in france but because it is only by knowing that we can respond generously enough to the needs of their work and only by understanding that we can save our own souls from that fat and contented ignorance which induces a sleep uncommonly like death nor as long as we listen to the girls themselves are we in any danger of thinking too much of them or of their work not a woman i met english or american working in france but said something like this and meant it what after all is anything we can do except in as much as it may help the men a little how could we bear to do nothing when the men are doing the most wonderful thing that has ever been done in the world the end that is the end of chapter fourteen and the end of the sword of deborah by f tennyson jesse read by marianne spiegel in two thousand and fourteen in commemoration of the outbreak of the first world war on twenty eighth july nineteen fourteen thank you for listening